Today on The Bottom Line, Ray Dalio says everyone should be holding gold. The Trump trade appears to be back on, plus Chicago economist Luigi Zingales explains what Milton Friedman got wrong. Hello, welcome to The Bottom Line, presented by Fidelity Investments. I'm Sarah Silverstein at the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. Last week, Business Insider CEO Henry Blodgett sat down with Ray Dalio, the head of the biggest hedge fund in the world, Bridgewater Associates. Here's what Dalio had to say about the only way to be successful in the markets. You recommend that most portfolios should contain some gold. Why? Yeah, of course. Why? That, a lot of people think it's not of course. In fact, it doesn't make sense. Well, first Why? of all, to structure a portfolio, the best way to structure a portfolio is is to have the right kind of balance in your portfolio. So, and some amount of gold. Gold serves a purpose. It is, first of all, a diversifier um, against other assets. Um, you know, we have this risk on, risk off thing. We have, um, we also have a monetary system. Uh, we have a, the Brenton Woods monetary system began after World War II, and it had the dollar as the world's reserve currency. Um, there's a risk there. There's a, a, a lot of dollar denominated debt and so on. If somebody that felt that they didn't want to hold that and so on, you could have exposures to that. So it's a diversifying asset in, uh, that is sensible and, and you know, that's the main reason to have gold in the portfolio, five to 10 percent. People, I don't understand it. People will have more in uh, terms of cash or they'll have one. The key into, in terms of being able to have a successful portfolio um, as, a, as your core uh, portfolio, in other words, what's your strategic asset allocation mix? What is your, if you're, let me, let me. Oh. I got it. Let me ask you about Bitcoin. Okay. So Bitcoin, people say the same thing. It's a store of value. You've got to have it diversified. The dollar's not safe. It's been going up and up and up, yet recently it crashed. Jamie Dimon came out and said it's a complete fraud. He'd fire anybody at JP Morgan who invested in it because he wouldn't want people that stupid working for him. What do you think? There are two purposes of a currency. Is it a medium of exchange? And is it a storehold of wealth? Those are the basic ingredients. Bitcoin is not an effective medium of exchange by and large. And, uh, 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 if I go, ch I have a Bitcoin, I want to go buy things. It's not easy to buy things with the Bitcoin. And in terms of a storehold of wealth, a storehold of wealth uh, more reflects, like gold more reflects the opposite of what money is doing, right? And so you look at it, it's a storehold of wealth. Bitcoin is a speculative, uh, it's a speculative bubble, right? Its price is like a greater fool theory in terms of its price. If you say, what is its intrinsic value? If, if Bitcoin was made into a more effective medium of exchange and also uh, operated in terms of a storehold of wealth, not of the reflection of that volatility, it would be a, a viable instrument. It is, to me, a vehicle for speculation that's attracting people in, and it has all the classic ingredients of a bubble, people leveraging themselves up, and it doesn't have the, that same intrinsic value. Even the privacy value, okay, is suspe suspicious. In other words, it has a purpose to some extent. If you're living in a country and you don't know your currency, uh, whether it's going to be good or not, and you might hold, try to hold that. But that thing you're holding is running around like crazy for reasons that you don't understand. And then, it, so it's not going to be an effective storeholder well. And the privacy will be stress tested. In other words, governments are examining who is operating in their own clever ways of what that, and so you can't even assume that that's so it's going to be a privacy vehicle. So I don't see the effectiveness of Bitcoin. I could see uh, cyber secure, uh, currencies and, and so on, uh, but cryptocurrencies. But this is not what we're having. It's, it's, you know, it's a possibility that I think is, has been captured as a speculative vehicle that's in the middle of a bubble. You said something else about investing that I think is very profound and simple that I think a lot of people don't understand, which is to be successful as an investor, you have to bet against the consensus and be right. First of all, why? Why can't we just buy well, stocks we think are Well, the, co the consensus is built into the price. So because the consensus is built to the price and assets price themselves in a way that they're all, they're all compete and they're all of equal value in certain sense. There's, there's risk premium of equities over cash and bonds will have a, that over whatever, but it's basically they're all priced 
that way. It's like, think of it as going to um, betting on a sports team, or in other words, you, or uh, uh, a, a horse racing. Okay, so there's handicapping that's going on. So in order to be successful, you're betting against the consensus and you have to be right. That's the, that's the game. And you described your first trade when you were a teenager, bought a stock, it tripled, you thought, hey, this is easy, but you convey very effectively that in fact it is extremely difficult, even though it seems so simple. Uh, being successful in the markets is more difficult than being successful in competing in the Olympics. Your odds are higher to be successful competing in the Olympics because you have more people trying to do it. You have more resources. We put hundreds of millions of dollars. We have at Bridgewater 1,500 people. We're now competing against other teams. And that's the kind of resources that are going into playing that particular game. So think about that in terms of handicapping it. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, what you can do is achieve balance. You can, you can, to know how to hold a balanced portfolio and to receive something that is a return that's much better than cash achieving balance is something that you can do. And, and I, I think that that, but it, figure, if you're going to enter the game, since value added is a zero sum game, you have to ask who are you playing against? What is this, who are you going in the poker game with? And you know, do you want to do that? And as you talk to people in the real world, is your sense that people understand what they're up against when they might buy a stock or try to time the um, market? Institutional investors um, who are smart, by and large, understand that. The average man tends to be much more reactive. If you look at the purchases and sales that they make, when something goes up, they're more likely to buy it. They think, ah, that's a good investment. They don't know how to measure that in terms of, oh, is that a much more expensive investment that's more likely to go down? So that's why you, know, you put ads in newspapers and they say, ah, oh, that's what had that return. That's what they're attracted to. So they tend to buy high and sell low. And so they're not, the average man should not be playing this game in that way. They should be playing the game, uh, and, or humility. If you, if, you, if you think that you're good at playing the game, just make sure that it's like going to the poker table or going to the uh, racetrack. Do it with a little bit of money and watch it and get the best advice that you can to know that you're going to be able to take money out of the system rather than put it in. Ray, you've written a terrific book. Thank you so much for sharing your life and wisdom and, and best of luck. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. It looks like the Trump trade is back on because of a tax proposal that is, we're expected to see on Monday, which should lay out the specifications for a corporate tax cut. Trump has been talking about a federal corporate tax cut from 35% to 15% since 2015. J.B. Morgan, head of equity strategy, says as long as headlines continue to indicate political traction, we believe investors are likely to start pricing in higher probability of tax reform. And if you look at the Goldman Sachs basket of stocks that are most likely to benefit, from a tax cut, you'll see that they outperformed the broader market right when Trump was elected and then started to correct. But for over the last few weeks, these stocks have started to outperform again on optimism for a tax cut. So how much of a boost could this give stocks? According to JP Morgan, cutting the tax rate from 35% to 25% could increase S&P 500 earnings by $11 per share, bringing it up to $143 per share, which would increase the index 150 points at the current multiple. Jim Fabio, Senior Vice President of Government Relations for Fidelity Investment, points out that before tax reform can advance, Congress needs to pass a budget for 2018 to provide the protected vehicle known as budget reconciliation, which would allow tax reform to pass the Senate with only 51 votes, which means that political pressure to get tax reform could actually help us agree on a budget. But as Fidelity Investments' Jurian Timmer points out, most long-term investors shouldn't react to short-term events. And that's today's bottom line. As a Chicago Booth alum, I consider myself very lucky to have had the opportunity to interview Luigi Zingales of Chicago Booth about his new research, which challenges some of Milton Friedman's assumptions about maximizing shareholder value. I'm thrilled to be here with Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, Luigi Zingales. Thank you for joining me. My pleasure. 
So at Business Insider, we talk a lot about better capitalism, which we define as companies that look at not just shareholder value, but also the welfare of employees and um, consumers, as well as the world. And you recently came out with a paper that kind of has a more elegant way of doing this by incorporating all of that into shareholder value. Can you explain? Yes, I wouldn't say that necessarily is a more elegant way. It's, it's a more precise way to sort of refine the issue because uh, we're all very familiar with the uh, Friedman statement that the only responsibility, social responsibility of business is to maximize profits. And um, that uh, uh, sort of conclusion is derived by Friedman starting from a, an important premise. Number one is that uh, managers should care about uh, their principals that are the shareholders. And we actually, this is a paper with Oliver Hart from Harvard, uh, we actually start from the same premise. But we reach a slightly different, or maybe not slightly different, uh, uh, conclusion because uh, we point out uh, a, an important consideration. Number one is shareholders care about things other than money. Um, like people care things other than money. Uh, I'm an academic and if I only care about money, I would not be an academic. So there is something more important or at least as important as money. Um, this is not enough because uh, Friedman did recognize that possibility. Um, however, Friedman says, as long as sort of uh, you can separate, he doesn't use exactly this language, but as long as you can separate your social decision from your business decision, then the problem is solved. Um, think about corporate charity. Um, if I'm a corporation, I can distribute profits, and my shareholders can decide where to allocate those profits. Uh, there is no inefficiency in transferring the money to them, and it's strictly better because the shareholders can pick what they want rather than the company. So if the decision uh, that has social implication uh, is completely independent and separate from the business decision, like corporate charity is, uh, Friedman is absolutely right. Uh, what you should do is maximize profits, distribute the profits, and then people take care. However, most business decisions are not like that. If I want, I'm concerned about CO2, for example. Um, if I pollute more and uh, uh, emit more CO2, and then distribute the extra profit to my shareholders, it costs more for them to undo my CO2 emission than uh, would be to me to curb the CO2 emission to begin with. Or to cite a, a recent case, uh, a shareholder would, wanted to ask uh, Walmart to stop selling in its store the high-capacity magazines used in mass uh, uh, killings. And um, this is uh, not that if you make the extra bucks by selling the high-capacity magazine, then you rebate to the shareholders, the shareholders can prevent the mass killings. No, it's not going to work that way. So in those situations that we call technically they're not separable, then uh, you need to consider in your business decision what shareholders want. Uh, want. And uh, they might want only you to maximize profits, but they might want other things. In particular, if your shareholders are foundation or university endowments, they might have other objectives than just money. And, and I think that uh, we kind of have forgotten this in uh, uh, the standard debate. And we want to bring it at the forefront so that actually shareholders can direct where the, and this decision can have an influence in this decision. So shareholder welfare is not necessarily equivalent to market value. Absolutely not. And, and as I said, people care about things other than, than market value. They care about uh, uh, not having mass uh, killings in the United States. They care about maybe not having so much CO2, or they might care about other things. And one of the examples I've seen you talk about is Screlly, Martin Screlly. And, how, and he uses this as an explanation for what he did, that my sole responsibility is to increase my shareholder value. How did that become a rule? Because it's not a real rule, necessarily. I think that that's part of uh, the contribution, I think, and the value of what, what we have written. Because I think that uh, from uh, the 1960s, when, uh, 70, when uh, Milton Friedman wrote that piece, uh, to today, uh, the idea of maximization of shareholders' value have become the dominant mantra. In the 1970s, when Friedman was writing, uh, was kind of an extreme position that people did not embrace. And in the last uh, um, kind of almost 50 years, it, it has become uh, the dominant position to a point that people abuse it. And, and the example you, you quote is an example of uh, a, a, an investor who um, at least uses a justification that he had to uh, maximize uh, shareholders' value against anything else. And 
first of all, in the law, there is not such an obligation. Uh, but more importantly, I don't think that even if we go from first principle in finance, uh, the obligation is so narrow. It's maximization of shareholders' welfare, not necessarily wealth. And is there an example of a company or companies that are doing this already that are looking at the shareholders, all of what they care about, not just their value, not just the market value? I think that uh, we see a lot of companies, especially privately held ones, uh, that have other objectives in mind. Uh, I come from uh, a region in Italy where there are a lot of small firms, uh, and unfortunately, um, we suffer a long uh, recession, and many of those firms fail, and uh, many um, entrepreneurs actually committed suicide and left uh, their life insurance to pay for the employees because they deeply care about the employees. Uh, it's, for them, it's almost like family. And um, now, maybe the, you can think this is a bit of excessive, but what this is saying in probably health companies, there is a, a huge sense of uh, other things are important besides just uh, money. And uh, once you become a larger company, um, we seem to like uh, rush to the minimum common denominator and uh, often against the interest of the shareholders themselves because shareholders might be, as I said, foundations, endowments, uh, people who by statue care about things other than, than money, uh, but when they invest, they leave it at home. And some of the solutions to this, the socially responsible investing right now, avoid certain companies, and you don't think that's necessarily the solution? Yes, I think that uh, there are uh, two approaches that are prevalent today. One is the approach of divesting. And uh, I think that this approach not only is not particularly useful, it might be even counterproductive. So if I am a what we call social investor and I avoid all stock, um, all stock will end up in the, in, the, in the hands of people who don't care at all about uh, the environment, uh, leading to a worse outcome uh, than the one we had to begin with. And in a world where money is fungible, you don't really penalize them unless like 90% of the market think that way, you're not gonna have a, a big impact. So that's, that's problem number one. Problem number two is um, all this trend in, in corporate social responsibility or as the Europeans say, ESG, environment, uh, uh, sustainability and growth is very much decided by a few people who wake up in the morning and say this is the objective we should follow. And what we say is at the end of the day the shareholders are the owners of the, the company and uh, they should uh, rule on this decision. They should not be sort of uh, uh, removed to somebody else, uh, including institutional investors. Uh, what we advocate in, in the paper is that uh, institutional investors need to sample uh, or poll their, their investors uh, to know what their investors want. So stay in the stock, get in the stock, and try to drive decisions. Drive decisions, but also drive decisions according to what their investors want, not what they decide. And last question, what do you think everybody gets wrong about responsible capitalism, or what is the thing that needs to change? I think that uh, uh, sometimes we want to project too much of our uh, desire into sort of uh, um, the, the system that uh, cannot uh, bear too much of, the, of all this responsibility. So what I like of uh, the paper I, I wrote with Oliver Hart is that uh, we take uh, a, a narrow perspective, but uh, I think a very solid one, uh, both uh, logically and I think legally. Um, and I think that uh, tells you what business can do and what business cannot do. I think that. Uh, uh, Milton Friedman was right in saying you should not give all this social responsibility because at the end of the day, you need to uh, be self-sustained, you need to create uh, uh, value, and, uh, and so you need to pay attention to these things. You can't uh, transform all businesses in social enterprises. We do have non-profits, uh, associations, and businesses, and they're very valuable, but we cannot transform everything into that. Um, on the other hand, you don't want to be sort of so narrow that saying that uh, uh, people care only about money and uh, ignore other important considerations that are part of uh, our welfare. Well, thank you so much, Professor Zingales. My pleasure. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for joining us. A big thank you to Fidelity Investments for making the show possible. And, of course, a thank you to NASDAQ for hosting us.